on World News Tonight. Origin ordeal. The WHO reveals suspicions of a possible link between the pandemic's beginning and Chinese labs. Rising waters. Germany suffers rising death tolls amidst the country's worst flooding in years. A swan song. Merkel prepares for a final goodbye on an international trip, leaving behind a legacy. Sunken City. Dubai opens a world record breaking pool complete with libraries and arcades. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the updates of the COVID crisis. The head of the World Health Organization has acknowledged it was premature to rule out a potential link between the COVID-19 pandemic and a laboratory leak and said that he is asking China to be more transparent as scientists search for the origins of the coronavirus. We are asking actually China to be transparent, open, and cooperate. The head of the World Health Organization on Thursday said that investigations into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic in China were being hampered by the lack of raw data on the first days of spread there and urged the country to be more transparent. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus also said there was a premature push to ignore the theory that the virus may have escaped from a Wuhan laboratory. Uh, there was a premature push to, um, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, reduce one of the uh, options like the lab theory. As you know, I was uh, a lab technician myself. I'm immunologist and I have worked in the lab and lab accidents happen. It's common. I have seen it happening. And I had, I myself had errors, so it can, it can happen. And we need information, direct information on what the situation of these labs was before and at the start of the pandemic. A joint report in March by a WHO-led team that spent four weeks in and around Wuhan with Chinese researchers said that the virus had probably been transmitted from bats to humans through another animal. It said that the laboratory leak theory was extremely unlikely, but other countries, including the United States and some scientists, have not been satisfied with that conclusion. China has called the lab leak theory absurd and said repeatedly that politicizing the issue will hinder investigations. I think we owe it to the millions who suffered and to the millions who died really to understand uh, what happened. And I hope there will be better cooperation. Tedros will brief the WHO's 194 member states on Friday regarding a proposed second phase of study to research the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. French vaccination centers are facing a wave of people wishing to get their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine following the announcement made by the government to push the population to get inoculated. To give us an update on this, we have other there in a world news special correspondent Chetana Dalmarata joining us now from Paris in France. Chetana? Yes, Shanali. In a televised speech, President Emmanuel Macron declared COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory for medical workers and extended use of a health pass, which was already required in nightclubs and large-scale events, to include restaurants, cinemas and theatres. The health pass will also be required to board long-distance trains and planes from the start of August, giving a further incentive for people to get the shot. The Théâtre des Zablons vaccination centre in neuilly sur seine of Paris has fully booked since the Macron speech. The centre will increase their vaccination capacity from 1,500 doses to 1,900 doses by the start of next week. Staff are also looking for more doctors and nurses to admit first-time vaccine getters in good conditions. Nationwide, 3 million people rushed to get inoculated since Monday. Health Minister Olivia Varen said during a visit of vaccination centre in the French Alphine city of Chambéry. But some patients said they 
felt forced to receive the vaccine to enjoy outdoor lives and their summer holidays. France reported nearly 4,000 new COVID-19 cases, including 914 patients in intensive care. Back to you, Chanel. Thank you. That was at the Terena World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharma Ratna reporting from Paris in France. The Australian state of Victoria was ordered into a five-day lockdown following a spike in COVID-19 infections. Joining Sydney as the country's two main population hubs battle an outbreak of the highly contagious Delta variant. Sydney residents woke to some good news on Thursday. COVID-19 cases slowed down after days of rising numbers. But it is still not enough to lift the lockdown, warned New South Wales State Premier Gladys Berejiklian. But she also warned that infections could rise again due to the growing number of people with the Delta strain moving around in the community, particularly in Sydney's southwest. Two deaths have been reported out of the city, the first for the country this year. Meanwhile, Victorian state capital Melbourne is preparing to follow Sydney into a lockdown after a team of furniture movers travelled from New South Wales through the state of Victoria while infectious. Just over 12% of Australia's adult population of around 20 and a half million have been fully vaccinated. Officials have pointed to changing medical advice for vaccines and supply shortages for its sluggish inoculation drive. A new outbreak of preventable diseases such as measles and polio have been skyrocketing amongst children, according to the UN, as routine vaccinations had been missed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Almost 23 million children missed out on routine vaccinations last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's the highest number in over a decade, UN agencies said on Thursday. It's fueling outbreaks of preventable diseases like measles, polio and many more. Here's UNICEF's immunisation chief, Ephraim Lamango. This latest data show an alarming increase in the number of children who did not receive any vaccines at all, which we call them zero-dose children, putting fate of millions of young lives in the balance. Most of these children that missed their first dose of vaccine live in communities affected by conflicts and crises, live in communities that are underserved, remote rural places, and they live in informal slum settings, particularly in urban poor areas. Measles is one of the world's most contagious diseases. It can be fatal in children under five. The World Health Organization say it's especially risky in African and Asian countries with weak health systems. Polio can cripple a child for life. The WHO and the UN said in an annual report that the gap in global vaccination coverage has set up a perfect storm, meaning children are left more vulnerable to infection just as countries begin to ease their COVID restrictions. Ten countries account for the majority of the 22.7 million children left unvaccinated or undervaccinated against diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis in 2020. That's 3.7 million more than in 2019 and the most since 2009. The report added that 66 countries postponed at least one vaccine campaign against preventable diseases. Some are now running catch-up programs. India, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Mali, Somalia and Yemen are among the countries most affected by the vaccine backslide. The WHO has urged countries not to lift public health and social distancing measures prematurely as they begin to emerge from the health crisis. The number of people who lost their lives in the heavy floods in the western part of Germany totaled over 80 in what is Germany's worst mass loss of life in years. To give us an update on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo joining us now from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. Over 80 people have died and dozens were still missing in Germany as heavy flooding struck the country, turning streams and streets into raging torrents. The worst of the flooding hit the states of Rhineland Palatinate and North Rhine Westphalia, where a record 148 litres of rain per square metre fell overnight. Grieving for the lost lives, Germany's Chancellor pledged the full power of the state to find those still missing. Germany is equipped with a well-developed flood control system which has previously resulted in very few human casualties from flooding. 
so this record rainfall and the preceding heat wave experts point out could be linked to climate change because as the Earth's temperature increases more water vapor stays in the atmosphere while rescue operations continue under severe conditions amid power cuts local weather experts predict the rain will last until friday afternoon with a further rainstorm forecast for southwestern parts of the country neighboring belgium has also been badly hit leaving at least 11 people dead and causing the evacuation of 1,800 residents, while the Netherlands, France and Switzerland have reported damage by the flooding. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Chancellor Angela Merkel visited the White House in her diplomatic swan song, a trip underlying how important the veteran German leader has been to the transatlantic relationship, but also highlighting the unanswered questions she leaves behind. In what may likely be her last visit to Washington as German Chancellor, Angela Merkel and U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday vowed to work together to defend against Russian aggression and stand up to anti-democratic actions by China. Biden reiterated his concerns about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline being built from Russia to Germany under the Baltic Sea, but he and Merkel were united in their belief that Russia should not use energy as a weapon. We stand together and will continue to stand together to defend our eastern flank allies at NATO against Russian aggression. During the joint news conference at the White House, Biden said both countries would stand up for democratic principles and universal rights when they saw China or any other country working to undermine a free and open society. The situation in Hong Kong has deteriorated and the Chinese uh, government uh, is not keeping its commitment that it made how it would deal with, with Hong Kong. And so it is more of an advisory as to what may happen in on Hong Kong. It's as simple as that and as complicated as that. During talks in the Oval Office earlier in the day, Biden called Merkel a great friend and said cooperation between the U.S. and Germany is strong and enduring, a sentiment echoed by Merkel. I'd like to say here how much I value friendship with the United States of America. I am more than aware of the contribution of America to a free and democratic Germany. Merkel, who has served as chancellor since 2005 and worked with four U.S. presidents during her tenure, plans to exit Germany's government after national elections in September. According to a new book by two Washington Post reporters, the chairman of the Joint Chief Staff, General Milley, compared former President Donald Trump's lies about the election to Nazi-era Germany. Uh, General Milley was reportedly also concerned Trump would attempt a coup. Explosive new reporting tonight describing the country's most senior military officer comparing former President Trump's lies about election fraud to Nazi-era Germany. Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman General Mark Milley reportedly telling aides before the January 6th insurrection, this is a Reichstag moment, the gospel of the Fuhrer. That's according to the new book by two Washington Post reporters based on interviews with more than 140 people with newly revealed details of fears from top military brass about how close the country was to chaos. Milley concerned about a coup, quote, they may try, but they're not going to bleeping succeed, he reportedly told his deputies. You can't do this without the military, adding, we're the guys with the guns. Mr. Trump, who's still dangling the prospect of a 2024 run today, saying he never threatened a coup and, quote, if I was going to do a coup, one of the last people I would want to do it with is General Mark Milley, slamming him as a better politician than a general. A spokesperson for Milley declining to comment. Now on the latest row between the U.S. and China, the United States is preparing to impose sanctions on a number of Chinese officials over Beijing's crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong, as well as a warning to international businesses operating there about deteriorating conditions. The U.S. is set to slap sanctions on Chinese officials Friday over what President Joe Biden called the deteriorating situation in Hong Kong. That's according to two sources familiar with the matter. It's the Biden administration's latest plan to hold China accountable for its crackdown on the former British colony and is certain to anger Beijing. 
The sources said the financial sanctions would target seven officials from China's Hong Kong liaison office, which projects Beijing's influence into the Chinese territory. A separate advisory issued by the State Department would highlight U.S. government concerns about the impact of Hong Kong's national security law on international companies. Critics say Beijing implemented that law last year to facilitate a crackdown on pro-democracy activists and press freedom. Both sources said the measures were still subject to change. One said the White House was also reviewing a possible executive order on immigration from Hong Kong, but nothing was certain just yet. The U.S. Treasury Department has declined to comment on the issue, following media reports this week about possible new sanctions. Meanwhile, a visit to China by the State Department's number two official, Wendy Sherman, appears to have been canceled. The State Department also warned businesses on Tuesday about the growing risks of supply chain and investment links to China's Xinjiang region, citing evidence of forced labor and human rights abuses. A report from Amnesty focused on migrants intercepted in the Mediterranean and who disembarked in Libya in 2020 and 2021 suggest worsening conditions in camps despite being recently laced under the control of the Libyan Interior Ministry. The Amnesty report is highlighting once again the plight of those trying to cross the Mediterranean from Libya. It describes what it says are horrific violations against men, women and children intercepted at sea and forcibly returned to detention centers in the country. Amnesty's deputy director for the Middle East and North Africa says people are immediately funneled into arbitrary detention and systematically subjected to torture, sexual violence, forced labor and other exploitation with total impunity. The report is based on interviews with dozens of refugees and migrants from countries such as Nigeria, Somalia and Syria. Some pregnant women inside the camps told Amnesty they had been repeatedly raped by guards. Amnesty says the entire network of Libyan migration detention centers is rotten to its core and must be dismantled. Amnesty also condemns what it says is the ongoing complicity of European states for cooperating with the Libyan authorities. It wants Europe to suspend cooperation on migration and border control with Libya. Amnesty says EU-funded Libyan Coast Guards have intercepted around 15,000 people in the first six months of this year and returned them to Libya more than in the whole of 2020. Despite a truce between Libya's warring factions since October, armed groups still hold power on the ground, with some controlling migrant camps. Millions of Nigerians who were once solid financially footing can no longer reliably feed themselves or their families. Desmond Okori is doing anything he can to make ends meet. In Nigeria's financial capital, Lagos, he was once employed at a furniture store for over a decade. But at the start of the global health crisis, he was laid off. Now the father of five picks up used cans for recycling and also works as a bricklayer to feed his family. Rising prices of food staples in Africa's largest economy has only added to the strain. Prices of eggs, onions and palm oil have risen by at least 30 percent. While Okori says his weekly income is about $20, his family's weekly expenditure can sometimes be almost double that. Millions of Nigerians like Okori, once on solid financial footing, now rely on donated food to feed their families. Some go an entire day without eating. And the crisis in Africa's most populous nation is far from over. Inflation in the country is nearing an all-time high, largely due to soaring food prices. Rising unemployment and political insecurity in farming regions in the north only add to that. It's threatening to plunge more of the nation's formerly middle class into financial despair. The World Bank estimates that the drastic price changes in 2020 pushed 7 million more Nigerians into poverty, an increase of nearly 10%. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. City officials in the Belgian city have set up a crisis response center to take locals who have been displaced by rising floodwaters. 
The centre set up the gymnasium in a neighbourhood and has taken 1,000 people of roughly 250 families. The bodies of 10 Native American children who were buried on the grounds of what was once an Indian school in Pennsylvania were returned to their tribes by the US military that now runs the property of part of the US Army War College. Japan's top government spokesman said a Uganda athlete in Japan for the Olympic has gone missing and the team's host city in western Japan is conducting a search with police. Los Angeles County will reimpose its mask mandate this weekend in the latest sign that public health officials are struggling with an alarming rise in the coronavirus cases tied to the highly contagious Delta variant. According to China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment, the national carbon market started online trading, a significant step to help the country reduce its carbon footprint and meet emission targets. And finally tonight, Dubai, famous for skyscrapers, also holds the deepest swimming pool in the world. Divers in Dubai can explore an underwater sunken city in the world's deepest pool, which reaches depths of 60 meters at a facility called Deep Dive Dubai. The pool recorded as the deepest by Guinness World Records is filled with 14 million liters of water, equivalent to roughly six Olympic-sized swimming pools. Guests can discover the underwater world below its surface, swimming around multi-themed facilities, including a library and underwater arcade. The sunken city opened earlier this week but accepts divers on an invitation-only basis. Public bookings are set to start at the end of July. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.